Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. Today I have the pleasure of having guest Dr. Erica Lubliner join me today to talk about a very important topic of mindfulness. This is something that you may have heard about recently, mindfulness or sometimes called meditation um, in uh, social media, with, among your friends, on the news. You've probably heard the term. So today we're going to talk about what it is and how we can apply it to our lives. Um, a little bit about Dr. Lubliner. Doctora Erica Lubliner grew up in an immigrant Latino community and was the first in her family to receive a higher education at UCLA, where she double majored in history and women's studies with a minor in Chicano studies. She was admitted to the UCLA Drew program, where she took on leadership roles in the Latino Medical Student Association, LMSA, as co-chair and served as editor-in-chief of UCLA School of Medicine's humanities journal called The Beat. Doctora Lubliner completed a combined adult and child adolescent psychiatry program, and she currently serves as an associate program director training the new generation of psychiatrists. She also has a private practice. Doctora Erica, thank you so much for joining us today. It's such a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here. All right, so let's get down to this topic of mindfulness. I think you are a perfect person to talk to us about this because you are a psychiatrist um, in both child and adult psychiatry. And I think a lot of your life experiences have led you down the path to explore mindfulness as a tool that you can use in your own life as well as with your patients. So let's start with the big question. What exactly is mindfulness? So uh, a basic definition um, by John Kabat-Zinn, one of the founders of American-based mindfulness, is paying attention on purpose, non-judgmentally. Uh, you know, the way I think of mindfulness is the action of getting to know your mind and pausing before attaching an emotion or feeling to your thoughts. Uh, we're not taught to do that. We're kind of just thinking that they, they're uh, merged and they're the same thing. But I, I think what it does is it helps to expose the stories that we tell ourselves about, about ourselves, about others that may not always be accurate. And so the act of observing our thoughts without responding can be really powerful in regaining how we, how we feel. Um, another way is, is the idea that awareness of thoughts is helpful in gaining some insight which could lead to change, shifts, gratitude, appreciation, love. Yeah. yeah. So you talk about this process of observing your thoughts non-judgmentally. What's a real world example of that? You know, I think sometimes we will be in a situation and we interpret it a certain way, but we don't know exactly what preceded it or what happened. And so I think part of it is just to fill the role of the observer instead of the judge that we're so used to employing in our lives. You know, we're, we're taught to do it in school, to be critical of what we read and do. And so I think part of that is about taking on another role in our lives as, as the observer. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. All right. Well, I also want to know, how did you discover mindfulness? At what point in your life did you discover it? Did you start practicing it? And how has it helped you in your own life? So I learned mindfulness um, at a time in my life when I was struggling, you know, struggling emotionally and in other aspects of my life. You know, most of the struggle was internal as I had learned early on to take care of others' mental health and their physical well-being over my own, right? Which is a common thing um, since we're talking to students, you know, but it's a common thing amongst Latino students, especially Latinas. I had always had an interest in, in meditation, but other types of meditation had not resonated with me. I would get like eye strain and almost like a headache when, when I was looking at my third eye, you know, trying to, you know, it's one of those uh, strategies in other meditation traditions. So I don't know what that says about me, but I would get eye strain. <laughs> uh -huh. And um, in any case, mindfulness came to me when I needed change. You know, I, I've overcome many challenges in my life in childhood. You know, my father passed away when I was young. <clears throat> my family experienced, you know, poverty. Um, my mother was a single, you know, 
monolingual Spanish mother. And on my path to medicine, I also encountered, you know, um, many challenges as a first generation Latina pursuing uh, higher education. And then, you know, also first generation in medical school. And my path, you know, was not linear, you know, it was like more like a wonderful squiggly <laughs> doodle. <laughs> uh -huh. um, so when you're non-traditional, um, it can feel lonely. And, you know, it wasn't literally, you know, I've had wonderful friends, family, supporters, therapists, but when you're opening new paths, you know, it, it can feel very intimidating. And so I've had a lot of standardized test difficulty. You know, it's, again, the focus has been on others, on helping or taking care of others, and also about helping my community and contributing back. And there's been some insecurity about, you know, belonging in academia at, at all levels feeling like an outsider. And then there was, you know, an undiagnosed attention issue. So I'm neurodiverse, as they say nowadays. Uh -huh. And, you know, seriously, you know, I mean, I think that it's a, it's a really, you know, important issue and maybe another possible um, podcast for you to, to Absolutely. just address ADHD and learning disabilities in children and, and adults. So many of communities of color are, you know, seriously underdiagnosed and um, untreated. So I think that would be uh -huh. a really good topic, but I, I was agree. diagnosed, I was, yeah, I was diagnosed really late and um, because I didn't fit, you know, the stereotype of what, you know, the condition is, it just, and sometimes, you know, my mother didn't know how to identify it. You know, she, um, she just wanted me to do, to do well in school, but, you know, wasn't that involved because she was working. So, you know, so I had those challenges and then I felt very scattered at times. I was very productive and successful in many ways, but, you know, I was sometimes overdoing and overworking because I was compensating for that. And, and you know, there's also those issues of worthiness that we all struggle with too. So mindfulness, you know, provided me a space to look at myself to to value like my story. It allowed me to choose the responses that I wanted to have to life and not just be like on autopilot. One of the big things for me was that it reduced reactivity and reactivity is like this, you know, how you respond to emotions that are uncomfortable, you know, specifically. And so sometimes you can be in a situation where someone says something to you and it triggers you and it triggers like a negative response and it can give you the opportunity to choose to respond or to not respond. And I think that was also a really powerful thing to learn, you know, that I didn't have to respond to everything. There's so much stimuli everywhere, but I just didn't have to respond to it. And it just kind of, I'm going to use this word a lot, but empowered me because it felt that I could have some control over how I responded. It also, you know, really taught me to be flexible and to be less judgmental of myself and by extension of others. You know, many times when we're, we feel judgmental of others is that we have a very strong inner critic. Uh -huh. um, and as we, and as we soften with ourselves, we soften with others too. So, you know, mind you, it, it didn't happen overnight. It takes practice. It's called the mindfulness practice. I say uh -huh. that all the time. So, so don't be discouraged, discouraged, um, you know, um, those, of you hearing, you know, it, it's a, it's a process that we all go through. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, how did you learn the practice of mindfulness? Was it an official program that you went through? Was it through reading books? Was it just figuring it out on your own? So I learned mindfulness actually through a course, the local nonprofit, and it was, you know, mindfulness, um, it's called Inside LA, it's here locally. And I took an MBSR class, which is a mindfulness-based stress reduction, and it was about 11 weeks or so. And we basically just went once a week, listened, practiced, and then from there, you know, you could get certified and move on in, in your training. So that was just a real basic introduction there. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. So for maybe some of our listeners that have heard about mindfulness, but really don't know where to start. 
how can they start to practice mindfulness, this observation, this non-judgmental practice? How can they start to incorporate it into their lives, whether they have just a little bit of time or a lot of time? Yeah, really good question. Um, you know, it could be from like simple breathing and, and observation of our breath. It, you know, what that does is it brings you into the present and it decreases the stress response, you know? And so it's also the breathing, you know, aspect of it is not magic. It's very physiological. It's science, you know? So basically by extending our exhalation or, you know, the breath coming out, by extending that aspect, we can switch our nervous system from sympathetic, um, which is our fight or flight response, um, and to parasympathetic, which is rest and relaxation. This is, you know, again, you could count, you know, say to three on the inhale, hold for two, and then exhale slowly to five. And that would be as simple as that. Other ways are, you know, observing your, your body in segments and relaxing those areas as you observe them. So you can do it kind of sequentially from head to toe or, you know, vice versa from toes to head. And it's called a body scan. Um, so that's easy, something that you can kind of look up and find. And we can get, provide some resources if you'd like um, for the listeners in the notes um, later. Sure. Yeah. I've used body scans where, you know, sometimes I don't get from one end to my body to the other, you know, um, I fall asleep because it's just this slow progression. So that's a body scan that you can kind of just be present. But, you know, but I think is really great about meditation is that you don't need any equipment, you know, you only need yourself, it's portable, accessible, and you don't need to belong to any group or have a membership of any kind. You can be mindful when you walk. Those who come from religious backgrounds, you prayer is a way of being mindful too. And, and it's a type of um, being present and observing, you know, um, sending loving kindness, you know, to others. But you could do it in a crowded bus, you know, but don't don't drive and meditate, please. Um, <laughs> you could do it during the test. And so I often recommend um, my students and mentees that um, when the stress of the test is getting to them, that they can close their eyes, find their breath in their chest, um, then focus on the contact their their feet are making with the ground, then focus on their hands and what they feel like in that moment, um, and then go back to the exam. And, you know, um, it, it really does wonders. And I'm speaking from experience, you know, I, once I learned mindfulness, um, I had taken all my really stressful tests in med school already, but I recently took my child and adolescent psychiatry boards and uh -huh. it was really helpful to, to have that. I just, whenever I felt a little overwhelmed or, you know, or I was frustrated by a question that I didn't know, I would just say, okay, just take a, a, you know, a minute or two here to just relax and breathe, find your, you know, find your feet, find your hands. And then, you know, you can come back and have a, I've been in tests where I, I come back after doing just this very briefly. And I figured out that I had read the question wrong and that's why it was frustrated. So it can be really helpful during tests. Yeah, absolutely. I love how you make the point that you can do it when you're doing almost anything, obviously you don't want to close your eyes while driving, but, um, yeah. but even when I'm driving, you know, sometimes I'm in a hurry, like I'm running late somewhere and my imagination, my thoughts are going wild about the consequences of being late and why won't this car in front of me go faster? And why did the light turn red? And mm -hmm. I find that even practicing mindfulness in those moments is helpful mm -hmm. because what I do is I say, okay, you know what? My thoughts are getting out of control. <laughs> like, my thoughts are going crazy places. Our imagination is a wonderful thing, but our imagination can lead us into, you know, imagining futures that are never actually going to happen. Like I can be imagining, oh, I'm going to be late and my colleague is going to be mad at me and all this stuff, right? But if I just recognize that my thoughts are going out of control, I take a deep breath, <laughs> like you said, okay. Mm -hmm. And then I just pay attention to what actually is going on in this moment. Like, okay, yeah. I haven't even gotten there. I don't even know how late I'm going to be. Who cares? I can't change the fact that I'm running late. It is what it is. So I accept, I observe, I accept, 
take a deep breath. And then I try to shift my focus away from my thoughts that are going crazy to what is actually happening right now. Like, oh, look, I'm passing by a beautiful park. Let me look yes. at the trees. Let me look at the sky. Let me, you know, observe what other drivers are doing and just be curious about them instead of letting my imagination run wild and throw yeah. me into this anxiety loop, right? Definitely. And, you know, I think one thing, too, that that came to mind, too, is, you know, we have music in the in our cars, you know, uh -huh. um, and uh, we could also listen to music, you know, just really focus in on the instruments, the voice. Mm -hmm. What does it feel like? And and I think that could be another way of bringing you back into the present, you know. Uh -huh. so, Absolutely. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. But don't close your eyes. <laughs> no, don't close your eyes. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, another example that uh, recently I I can give is I was training for a half marathon and I was doing these long runs to train. And I am not a small person. You know, I have a larger body. Running is hard. It's not super easy for me. And so I really have to try to motivate myself to keep going and to get out there and do these long runs. Um, and lots of times when I run, I will start thinking over and over in my mind, oh my gosh, this is so hard. <laughs> this is so miserable. I'm sweating. I'm breathing hard. How much longer do I have? I'll look at my watch. Oh my gosh, I still have four miles left. Like it's, and I just, my mind goes into these loops of negative thoughts about how miserable it is. And when is this going to be over? And so recently I've started to try to practice mindfulness when I run. And so instead of letting my uh, autopilot negative thoughts kick in, I start telling myself, okay, this isn't hard. This isn't easy. I'm just going to observe what is happening. Like, okay, my body is breathing fast. Does that have to be a bad thing? No, it doesn't have to be a bad thing. It's only a bad thing because I'm judging it to be a bad thing <laughs> or like, okay, I'm slower than another runner that comes by me. Okay. It is what it is. Does that have to be a bad thing? No, it's only a bad thing because I'm judging it. <laughs> so that non-judgment, that non-judgment aspect of mindfulness has really helped me to have more positive runs where it's like, okay, I'm not judging. I'm just observing what my body can do. I'm respecting the limits of my body. And it actually helps me run faster because I'm not so in my head thinking these yeah. negative thoughts. It's like if we think negative thoughts, then our experience is going to be more negative because yeah. that's just how it works. So, yeah. 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 And, I, and I think that that's a wonderful example. Um, it could help you see what your body, how your body is moving and what your body mechanics are, are you know, at the moment and kind of help, yeah. help you shift or et cetera. Yeah, I, that is great. Yeah, I, I think that when I exercised and kind of thought a little bit about mindfulness, I feel like, oh, okay, I can relax a little bit. I don't have to be so tight. I don't, why am I uh -huh. holding my you know, my hands or my legs so tight? Like I can relax. So I can imagine uh -huh. that it'll make me faster. That's great. Yeah, yeah. So we've, we've used these terms mindfulness and we've also used the term meditation. It can be mm -hmm. a little confusing to distinguish the two. How do you understand the difference between mindfulness and meditation? Yeah, good question too. You know, for me, I you know, mindfulness is like a secular like version, so like an of more traditional meditation practices that have been around for thousands of years, and many of them originating, you know, in religious practices. And so the version that, you know, as I mentioned, the version that I was trained as MBSR that was developed by John Cabot Sin at the University of Massachusetts. And that's where I started. That's it's a very basic, like, you know, well, it has layers, obviously, but it's a very basic way of kind of practicing, you know, observation, all of that, you know, and through the years you grow, right? You, you know, you, you, you pick up different things, you listen to, you know, to talks, you learn a little bit about other traditions and you incorporate. So, you know, now it's more of a hybrid, but what I teach are really the basics, you know, about it, because I think that I also don't want to pretend that I'm practicing, you know, an, a religion, you know, I respect and have a lot of reverence for other religious practices, but I'm not 
interested in that aspect at this moment in my life, perhaps in the future, you know, not yeah. yet. Sure. <laughs> um, but I, but I, you know, I, so I, I, that's why I call it mindfulness. And sometimes I also talk about meditation, but I want to just be sure that I'm not, you know, taking on a, a different meaning to it. Uh huh. Yeah. And from what I've observed, there are a lot of different types of meditation, but I like to think of mindfulness as the concept, the concept of stopping, observing what is actually happening right now, instead of letting your mind wander to the past or to the future and having that non-judgmental attitude as well. Meditation is more like, okay, let's take that principle and what are different ways in which we can practice? You know, you can go on top of a mountain and like cross your legs and like meditate that way. Or you can just yeah. meditate while you're running or meditate in your bathroom in the morning or while you take a shower. So I know that every, uh, obviously every tradition has its own way of applying mindfulness. And that's usually what we refer to as meditation is a more formalized practice of mindfulness. Yeah, that's good. I'm curious, mm -hmm. another question I have for you, especially since you're a psychiatrist, is there any research showing that mindfulness has positive effects on mental or physical health? Yeah, you know, there is a lot of research that has been done, you know, on mindfulness and also a lot of incorporation of mindfulness into many therapies, you know, so some therapies are mindfulness based or include a good section of their treatment is based on mindfulness. So there are many studies on the benefits. Uh, of course, there's always a need for more studies, um, but you know, it's meditation. There's not a lot of money in, in, uh -huh. in studying it, right? But there's some really wonderful researchers, you know, um, at different, you know, academic institutions, UCLA, San Diego, obviously across the country, there's been a lot of, of work there. But, you know, the researchers have brought in like experienced meditators, you know, Buddhist monks and scanned their brains to see what areas of the brain light up and what areas are more pronounced and, and diminished. So there's also studies on burnout in, in physicians, and, and it shows that mindfulness can be protective. And one really exciting group of studies have shown that it can prevent telomere shortening. Oh, wow. And, you know, that sounds kind of like a nerdy term, but it's, uh, we have, t you know, telomeres in our genes and these telomeres um, shorten with time. And so if they're shortened, they indicate a decreased lifespan that the body could be more vulnerable to disease and aging. And so the fact that, you know, there's some, you know, work on uh, or evidence that it can lengthen your life, you know, it's a, it's a pretty big deal. Uh -huh. um, so, so I think that we could certainly do more in, in researching you know, the impacts that meditation has not only to our emotional well-being, but also to our physiological kind of and, and to longevity. So mm -hmm. uh, that's pretty fascinating. As a psychiatrist yourself, do you ever recommend <laughs> mindfulness practices to your patients? And if you do, have you had any success stories that your patients have shared with you? Yeah, yeah. You know, I definitely I teach my patients, um, I teach a lot of pre-medical students or pre-health students, mentees, a lot of trainees, or, you know, and in these workshops, we often practice it. I, you know, we'll do a, a, a meditation, then we'll do a couple of them. And years later, I often hear from them saying like, Dr. Loveliner, I'm, I'm still meditating, you know, when I take tests, that sort of thing. So I also have advised med students that, you know, one way to do mindfulness is through the process of like washing your hands from entering a patient's room and also exiting. And so just kind of focusing on the temperature of the water, the feel of the of the soap on your hands um, and and, you know, drying your hands, that sort of thing. I think it could be really a way to bring you into the present and kind of allow you to move on to the next, you know, phase of your day or the next patient. So um, I have found that many um, med students enjoy that and have told me that it, it's helpful. So mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah, especially incorporating it into the clinical day. 
I find that clinical medicine can be really stressful because like, for example, right now I work in urgent care. Um, so there are times when I see the board, which is like the computer screen that lists all the patients that are waiting to be seen. I see, you know, another name jump on and another and another, and all of a sudden there are eight patients in the waiting room and there's only one of me. So that can be really stressful and my heart starts to race and I start to think, oh my gosh, how am I going to like do all of this work quickly? How am I going to see all of them so that nobody has to wait for two hours? (laughs) So Mm -hmm. I find that in those moments when I catch myself getting really anxious about everything I have to do in the next (laughs) hour or so, just taking a deep breath. Okay. (sighs) You know, I'm just going to focus on the next patient. I don't need to think about the seven others that are behind. I just need to focus on the next patient, give them all of my attention. I will finish when I finish, and then I will give my attention to the next one. But that does take a lot of practice. It's still a struggle. I think a lot of doctors today face that kind of anxiety when there just seems like there's so much work to do in a clinical day. Yes, of course. Yeah, no, it's true. So maybe, you know, kind of how finding little like rituals and how we approach patients or after patients can be Uh really helpful. Yeah, Yeah. but I love that because we all have to wash our hands before and after. So that's like a great point of like a reminder to do that. So thanks for sharing that. Of course. Some people hear about mindfulness or meditation and they're pretty skeptical. It can seem kind of like hippy dippy nonsense. At least that's kind of what it felt like to me when I first encountered it. What Mm -hmm. would you say to someone who's pretty skeptical at first? Yes, I I had my (laughs) biases. My bias is about meditation. I think it, to me, it felt very new agey, you know, um, and, and, and like I mentioned before, like it felt foreign to me, you know, and I thought it belonged to a a culture that was not, you know, mine. And I didn't want to like appropriate, you know, (laughs) sometimes the, the, the concern. And so it felt inaccessible. And I think the other part for me, some of the, the resistance was cultural, you know, like in, in, in Latino culture, you know, we don't promote a culture of, of doing nothing. It's like, we have many Spanish words for lazy. <laughs> uh-huh. um, and so if you're doing nothing, you're just sitting there, you know, you could be criticized and called that. So because we can be hyper vigilant in, in, you know, immigrant families, because it's crucial to like surviving. I think that again, ignoring cues or environment and going within can kind of seem foolish or in other places like selfish. So I also you know, had ideas about meditation where it felt like it required me to go away, you know, and like you mentioned, sit on a mountain uh-huh. or, or go into nature and commune like Walden, you know, type of thing. Uh-huh. Um, and that was time intensive and, you know, it doesn't pay the bills. So I want to assure you that that's not what it requires. Another more recent critique um, about mindfulness is that it somehow burdens the small folk by not addressing the bigger isms in society, that it puts the like stressors of inequality, of di- discrimination on the individual to like solve themselves and manage their own anxiety and trauma, right? Mm-hmm. That it ignores institutional and like systemic barriers and the need for social change and justice. So, you know, I want to say that I don't think that there's a conflict between self-care and social change, you know. So when I do meditation, I'm not forgetting that society needs changing. In fact, I'm, I think it gives me a bigger bandwidth to explore how I can create change, what my place in the world is, to know my, you know, what I'm working with. And now I work in, in academia and, you know, I think, that I feel that mindfulness isn't making me ignore those issues that I came to medicine to help fix. So I just Uh wanted to say that because sometimes that's one of the barriers that I think can be there, you know, um, when practicing mindfulness. Perfect. Thank you. So how might mindfulness practices help students who are right in the middle of the grind of maybe getting through college, going to school, working, or applying to medical school? 
well, you know, I know that I, I wish I had known mindfulness like as a child, <laughs> uh-huh. um, but especially as an undergraduate, you know, or, or a post back or med student, um, it just wasn't around yet. But I think that it can be really helpful in increasing our focus, as I mentioned, decreasing our reactions to stress and anxiety. It can help us tolerate uncertainty. And again, it's about having a choice on on how you respond and if you respond. So it can help you change your thought patterns and get you out of survival mode and feel more empowered. You know, I'm using a lot of words here and phrases, but, you know, I think essentially meditation can help you manage your life better and get to know yourself and, and your own wisdom. You know, the one that that you have learned along the way through, you know, overcoming experiences and that you also carry within. I think that the hardships and the experiences that we've all been through have taught us many things. We're just not used to listening to ourselves. And I think meditation helps us open our ears and our hearts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that. I think especially if you're going through college, applying to medical school, in medical school, during those really busy times in life, it is really hard. We're, we're go, 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 go. There's always something to do. And we don't take that time to just quiet our minds, to stop and process and just pay attention. So I think that is the power of mindfulness and meditation is to, yeah. you don't have to take an hour per day. It could be just a few minutes or while you take a shower or <laughs> yeah, while you're yeah. walking to class, right. you can do this. And it, I love what you say that it, it is empowering. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it's not something that you learn overnight though. Like you pointed out earlier, it does take practice. It takes um, intentional practice and just like anything, the more you do it, the better you get at it. So, yeah. Well said. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Leveliner, for sharing your wisdom with us today and your experiences. Um, I hope that everyone listening today gives meditation or mindfulness a chance um, in whatever way you want to explore it. Go out, find there are some free apps out there. There are free YouTube videos, there are websites, blog posts. Um, learn a little bit more about it. Send us questions if you have them and see if it has the power to make a change in your own life. The only way to know is if you give it a try. So thank you again, and um, thanks everyone for listening. Until next time.